The Quran is a clear criterion that guides us to the right opinion. The Quran is a clear criterion that guides us to the right opinion. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidil Mursaleen Amma ba'du fa'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام عليك يا رسول الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا حبيب الله الصلاة والسلام عليك يا نبي الله وعلى آلك وأصحابك يا نور الله Welcome to the very first episode of our new program, The Clear Criterion. This program is about the Quran and will focus on the meanings of the verses of the Quran, the background of certain uh, chapters or surahs of the Quran we will look at some important points of legislation that are deduced or have been deduced by our noble Imams taken from the Quran. We do not assume a level of understanding in these programs so we'll begin with the very basic level of what the Quran itself is or how the Quran is defined in simple terms and in today's episode we will try to look at some points related to tafsir which in simple words is commentary and the more technical word I guess is exegesis. So what is the importance of exegesis or tafsir related to the Quran and how can we understand the important role of the scholars who contributed to in terms of explaining the Quran for the masses, for the public and making this knowledge accessible to those who are not just academics but people who uh, simply want to understand from their reading. Before we go into um, any of these points, I would like to share with you a point of excellence regarding sending blessings in favor of the best in creation, our beloved Prophet Al Mustafa sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam. He told us sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam that a person, as long as he invokes blessings upon him, as long as he sends um, a prayer of blessings in favor of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam. He receives divine mercy, mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now it is up to the individual whether he reads less or more. So for us as believers, we try to devote some time to this action of sending blessings in favor of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam. Ultimately, it is a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a means of attaining blessings in this world, forgiveness and elevation in the court of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So let us be Muslims, let us be believers who not only claim to love the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, we express this love or we reflect this love by invoking blessings upon him. Sallu ala al-habib sallallahu ta'ala ala Muhammad. Let us look at the Quran in simple terms, our understanding of the Quran, what it means. In simple terms, the Quran is the uncreated word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed to his beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. It reached us through mass transmission. The recitation of this is worship. I will explain a bit more about this. And the Quran was recorded or written from Surah Al-Fatiha until Surah Al-Nas and today we have the Qur'an in a complete form, in a book form, but years of effort or, and years of sacrifices led to the final formation of the Qur'an. We will look at the brief timeline of events or how this happened shortly. But the Qur'an itself, mass transmission, what do we mean by that? In Islam, there is a term that is used for mass transmission, a legislative term. Um, it's tawatur and tawatur basically means when something is transmitted and conveyed by such a large group of people from generation to generation that it is impossible for such a big group to come to agreement on um, upon a lie. So, so many people, it is impossible for so many of them to lie about a particular thing. In essence, this is what 
um, mass transmission means, that so many people narrated it, reported it, conveyed it, that large mass of people, one cannot say about them in normal terms, in normal situations, that so many people have lied about a particular statement or have falsely conveyed uh, or upheld a statement. So tawatur was the way that the Qur'an reached us. And in terms of hadith, then uh, the strongest and most authentic hadith narrations are often described as the uh, mutawatir hadith, the hadith that have reached us through mass transmission, although there are other factors to consider when we look at hadith um, as in terms of its authenticity. Coming back to the Qur'an itself, it was revealed to our beloved Prophet wasallam. It is not the word of an angel or any other creation. The Prophet wasallam also received uh, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that were not part of the Qur'an but a part of the hadith and they were referred to as the hadith Qudsi or some translate this as divine hadith. Now the divine hadith are obviously not Qur'an. And for this reason, some of the scholars, they include this point of its, about the Qur'an, its recitation is worship. And the reason why they include this part is to differentiate between that which was revealed to the Prophet wasallam as part of the Qur'an and anything else which came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which the Prophet wasallam expressed through his words, or through his tongue, and became the divine hadith or hadith Qudsi. Moving on to the point, the Qur'an itself and the meaning of the word Qur'an, in terms of its etymology, different scholars have mentioned uh, different words in terms of the origin of Qur'an. Some say it comes from Qarn, some say it comes from Qira'a, and some say it comes from Qar' with Hamza at the end. If we consider it from Qarn, the scholars explain that the meaning of Qarn is to join. And as the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has combined or joined verses, uh, the letters, the, the, the verses and the chapters of the Qur'an, they come together. This in essence is that Qarn element. And another reason which is given in the Qur'an itself, the wisdoms of the Qur'an are combined with legislation or laws. So we have points of wisdom in the Qur'an that are combined with or that join with points of legislation, points of law uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another point which is mentioned in this Qur'an concept, or this joining concept is that the Qur'an itself, it is it joins different evidences. So an evidence is mentioned and after that another evidence is mentioned. So these evidences are joined together and this is an element of Qarn. Another um, term that we used was Qira'a which means uh, to read. And the Qur'an comes from this because it is recited often. It is something which uh, people recite from the Muslim perspective, it's recited globally, it's memorized, it's repeated again and again. And as far as it, uh, the word Qur'an is considered in technical terms as an ism master. So the Qur'an uh, being for qira'a or the Qur'an being the same as kitab for maktub, it's like a, a maf'ul kind of meaning, so that which is recited in that meaning. Just like book in Arabic is kitab, but it actually represents that which is written, maktub. The same kind of concept applies to Qur'an. So the second was that it comes from qira'a, which means to read. And the third was uh, it's kind of similar to the first, I guess, Qara' with the Hamza at the end, that the Qur'an, it has a combining element. And in this combining element, one point that is mentioned is that it combines all the benefits of the previous revelations because the Qur'an, it confirms the original form of previous scriptures the scholars comment on this and they say that it actually combines the benefits of the previous revelations too. And in terms of excellence, it has excellence over previous revelations. The thought may come to mind if those were revelations from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
this is revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what is the difference and how can we say one has excellence? The excellence here means excellence in terms of what is more rewarding for us. So for us, it is more rewarding for, uh, to recite the Qur'an, to understand the Qur'an, to study the Qur'an. And it's in this sense that the excellence is mentioned. If we look at it from the other perspective, it also it includes the uh, wisdom and the benefit of a pr the previous revelations. Uh, not just one, but all of them combined can be found in the Qur'an. Again, this is the case of deduction. This is a case of profound knowledge. And not everyone can deduce equally. As we know, the likes of Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala and who he himself once declared that it were he to uh, write or comment on Surah Al-Fatiha, it would fill or it would load 70 camels. And as we know, a camel, a minimum a camel can carry on a journey. Uh, uh, over 120, 130 kg, some say up to 450 kg. That's how much one camel can carry. And Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu is saying that he could uh, expound on just Surah Al-Fatiha to such an extent it would fill or it would load 70 camels. This is a reminder of the excellence and the knowledge, the insight of the great Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Coming back to this point, um, how does the Qur'an have a combining element? Uh, another reason that's given is because it has combined all uh, sciences. Now, whether we are able to identify those sciences in the Qur'an or not, this is a different matter. Um, if we look at something as uh, technical and specific in science as embryology, then 500 years ago, or even less than that, in fact, um, looking at the description of the human embryo mentioned in the Quran, even science had not reached that stage of being able to identify the very uh, delicate and early stages of human development. But later on in science, um, with the advancement of technology, the science became better and now when that science is used to look at the descriptions of the Qur'an, some connections or some important connections were made and people, some people even embraced Islam when they discovered or they identified the embedded science within the Qur'an. We do not look at the Qur'an or we do not use science to justify the greatness of the Qur'an and I say that in in terms of um, an approach that people might think one should adopt. We know the Qur'an is the greatest book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is the greatest source of wisdom. Its wisdom is something which scholars have spent their lives trying to uh, reveal. And they did their part and they wrote volumes upon volumes to explain this word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we don't use science to justify this greatness. We look at the greatness of the Quran or we reflect upon the verses of the Quran. And if we see anything that science has also mentioned, we make that connection and we try to use this in our uh, preaching and call people um, intellectual, academics or people who are in a certain field and you come. Look and see for yourself and see how the Qur'an has addressed certain subjects which 1400 years ago would not have come to the minds of the masses of the people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this gift to this ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As far as the Qur'an is concerned, it was revealed uh, in Ramadan, the revelation began over a 23 year period. Sayyidina Jibreel alayhi salam came with the revelation to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some verses were revealed directly to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the night of ascension. There are different stages of the revelation of the Quran in terms of the divine tablet and then the first um, heaven and the formal um, revelation that, that I am referring to here is over that 23 year period. And the reason why this happened, as our scholars have explained, this was mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that unlike previous scriptures and revelations which were all revealed in their entirety, the Quran was revealed uh, on different occasions due to different events to uh, guide on different matters and 
the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and whom were able to um, take, absorb this knowledge and to learn this directly from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So this was a mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the Qur'an was gradually revealed. In terms of the revelation of the Qur'an, it was revealed in different stages, on different occasions. And it was the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam himself who guided the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum in terms of the sequence of the Qur'an, which verse comes before um, other verses, which surah comes before other surah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he informed the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum about the sequence of the chapters of the Qur'an. And the Sahaba, as the Qur'an was being revealed, they were recording the Qur'an. Some of them even, uh, they used rocks or uh, the bones of large animals like camels to inscribe or write or record whatever they could memorize from the revelation uh, that came to the Prophet sallallahu the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum memorized the Qur'an all the time in its entirety. So this was the grace of Allah subhanahu ta'ala as he himself has said in the Qur'an that he made learning the Qur'an or memorizing the Qur'an easy. So the Sahaba memorized the whole Qur'an all the time. In the time of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhum, when the false claimant of prophethood, Musaylama Kathab, the, the liar, uh, came, he claimed prophethood, and Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala, and who fought against him, many of the companions who had memorized the Qur'an, who were huffaz of the Qur'an, they were martyred. And on this occasion, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala, and who he approached the Khalifa, of the, the first Khalifa of the Muslims, Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala, and, who, and they had this discussion, Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala, and who was pushing for this, that the Qur'an be gathered. In book form, Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala, who was apprehensive, he was concerned that it was a matter which was not directly instructed by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but Sayyidina Umar, he continued to uh, urge him saying that this is a matter of khair, it's goodness. And the fact that Sahaba who had memorized um, had been martyred so in a way of preservation, it would help the cause of the Muslims. Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he accepted this suggestion and he instructed Sayyidina Zayd bin Thabit Ansari and other um, huffaz of the Qur'an among the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum to start the process of gathering uh, the Qur'an into uh, a preserved kind of book form. So the process began in the time of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhum. But it was only, and it continued in the time of Sayyidina Umar radiallahu ta'ala an, with Ummul Mu'mineen, Sayyidatuna Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala an, her contributing to this with what she had. But remember in the early days or in the time of the, after the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Qur'an, although it was revealed in the language or in the dialect of the Quraysh, different regions where Muslims were, they had, um, some difference in terms of how the Qur'an was recited. So you can say, uh, not really accents, but um, different ways of reciting um, the Qur'an. So in the time of Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu anh, this became a sensitive matter. You had Muslims who began to argue with each other about whose version of recitation or dialect rather, was the correct one. So Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu ta'ala, and he made this decision that the dialect, the way of the Quraysh, the Quran revealed in that form, that it becomes the standard and it is put into book form, into one volume or into one uh, gathered form. And then this form is sent out to the Muslims in the various regions. And they are told that this is the form or the, the way the Quran will be recited from this day forth. And hence, this is why Sayyidina Usman ta'ala anhu is referred to as Jami'ul Quran, the one who gathered the Quran. So it started, the process started in terms of formally um, efforts began in the time of Sayyidina Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala an, but in the time of Sayyidina Usman radiallahu an, the Qur'an was gathered and 
the form that he upheld was the form that was sent to the re different regions and Muslims were instructed to maintain this way of recitation. In terms of tafsir of the Quran or in terms of exegesis, the Quran begins in terms of its explanation. The source of explaining the Quran is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself and his beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. What do we mean by this? I will explain shortly, but the Quran revealed to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was taught Allah taught the Quran to his beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he did not just reveal the message of the Quran to him. He taught him the deeper meanings of the Quran too. So when the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and who wanted to understand a verse, they would come to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam for the clarification. So what is exegesis or tafsir? It is basically um, the knowing the meanings of the Qur'an and knowing about the revelation of the Qur'an. This discussion, the focal point of uh, commentary or exegesis is the Qur'an itself. The whole purpose is to understand what the verse refers to. What is the context of the verse? Is it something, uh, does it refer to a ruling that uh, applies or does it mention a ruling that is now abrogated? So these are some of the discussions, but the main focal point being the actual meaning of the verses of the Quran. And it comes from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam, ultimately from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, because Allah Himself explains some verses of the Quran with other verses. And what is the benefit of exegesis or the commentary of the Qur'an, you're probably thinking it's an obvious question to understand the Qur'an. Yes, it is to gain a better understanding of the Qur'an, but also to learn about uh, creed, to learn about the legislation, um, the, the laws of the Qur'an or the laws in our Sharia. And not just that, to learn uh, about the different points of etiquette that make a human being a better person, that make believers a reach an elevation in a state of piety. These are some of the themes of the Qur'an. And why is it important to understand uh, the Qur'an through tafsir? And is it, the thought might come to mind that can the Qur'an be understood without, uh, directly, just by looking at uh, the verses. Some verses can be understood because they're quite explicit, but generally speaking, this is not the approach that one has to the Quran. The Quran is understood through those who explained the Quran, who had the authority and knowledge to do so, beginning with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and then the Sahaba after him, the followers after the Sahaba, and then those who came after them who wrote volumes about uh, the uh, commentary of the Qur'an or explaining the Qur'an. So in terms of commentary, we have four different eras. One is the prophetic era where the Prophet wasallam explained certain verses to the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and whom Allah subhanahu ta'ala describes the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as being one who yatlu alayhim ayatihi that he recites the verses to, to them. And what else does the Prophet ﷺ do? him, He purifies them. الْحِكْمَةِ And he teaches them the book and wisdom. The Qur'an was revealed to the Prophet ﷺ so that he teaches it. Even though the Sahaba knew Arabic, they were taught the deeper meanings of the Qur'an. They were, on occasions, when the Prophet quoted a verse, the Sahaba, even though they knew Arabic, they would ask what it meant. And then the Prophet ﷺ would explain the meaning. The likes of Sayyidah Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu ta'ala anha, we find examples of her seeking clarification from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. So different companions had different levels of understanding of the Qur'an depending on the time that they spent with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and how much they learnt from him. So some narrations mention that they will not move on in their learning from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, until they understood the 10 verses that they were focusing on. So they would move on, do some verses, understand them fully, and then move on and study other verses with the Prophet wasallam. The famous Sahaba known for their knowledge of tafsir, obviously Sayyidina Uthman, Sayyidina Ali radiallahu anhu, Sayyidina Abdullah bin Abbas, Sayyidina Abdullah bin Mas'ud, 
سيدنا عبيج بن كعب سيدنا زيد بن ثابت سيدنا عبد الله بن عمر بن عاص سيدنا ابو موسى الاشعري وسيدنا ابو دردا رضي الله تعالى عنه So we have the time of the Prophet Sallallahu and the time of the Sahaba and these Sahaba that I just mentioned especially at the forefront the third um, time being the time of the Tabi'oon and they learnt directly from the Sahaba radiyallahu ta'ala and whom and benefited from the knowledge that the Sahaba radiyallahu ta'ala and whom gave them and the clarifications that they provided and among them uh, Ibn al-Musayyab, Sayyiduna Urwa, Salim, Sayyiduna Umar bin Abdul Aziz Uh, Sulaiman bin Yasar, Atar bin Yasar, Zayd bin Aslam, Ibn Shihab Zuhri, Imam Hassan Basri, Sayyiduna Mujahid, Al-Qama, Sayyiduna Qatada, Imam Ibn Sirin, Sayyiduna Ibrahim Nakhari, Imam Sha'bi. Uh, Ibn Sirin is quoted to be very strict upon who, upon uh, the fact that he would not take narrations from people until they mentioned who their teacher or sheikh was. So these are some important figures who contributed to the Quran. And then after the time of the Tabi'un and when the Umayyad and the Abbasid period came, a lot of scholars in Islam, they worked hard tirelessly to gather information clarifications, explanations of verses of the Qur'an and they wrote volumes upon volumes um, in terms of exegesis. Many of their works we find today in book form and the scholars of Islam continue to, continue to benefit from them. A lot of modern commentaries that we find have been taken from these classical works. I would like to share the names of some of those works with you. Jami al Bayan from Imam Tabari. We also have Tafsir al Quran al Azim. We have Ta'wilat Ahl Sunnah. Ahkam al Quran is a name that appears for at least three different books or three different tafsir works of different scholars. We have Ma'alim al Tanzil fi Tafsir al Quran. Imam Razi's famous work, Al Tafsir al Kabir. And we have Al Jami li Ahkam al Quran. أنوار التنزيل وأسرار التعويل مدارك التنزيل وحقائق التعويل لباب التعويل في معاني التنزيل البحر المحيط الدر المنثور The famous Tafsir Jalalain روح البيان روح المعاني And we have the Hashia of Jalalain, Hashia to Jubal And we also have Hashiyat al-Sawi among the tafsir works that are considered to be classical. And then in more modern times, in different languages, the scholars of the Ahl sunnah they wrote on this subject. But primarily, their primary sources were the classical works written by the scholars of the past. It's important to understand that tafsir or exegesis is something which comes from narration. One cannot give his personal opinion about the Qur'an and say that he thinks the Qur'an means this in terms of mentioning something which can only come from narration. The essence of tafsir or exegesis or commentary of the Qur'an is mentioning those elements about the meaning of verses or mentioning those elements about the Qur'an which cannot be attained through understanding or intelligence. They have to come from narration. They can't come from deduction. That information have come from some kind of report. In other words, something related to the day of judgment or something related to heaven or hell or matters of the unseen. These are not matters that someone can think about and then come to a conclusion that uh, they will occur. These matters will only come through reports Uh, or narrations or, that come from the Sahaba or the Prophet Sallallahu So tafsir, in essence, it is based upon narration. It is based upon what was said by uh, those who, have, uh, who are linked to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In simple terms, it's through naql, it's through narration. And ta'wil, that is when someone use a scholar for example uses his knowledge of the arabic language to point out some points regarding the uh, uh, the etymology of a word maybe or uh, possibly the, um, a grammatical point 
or a point of rhetoric. This comes from knowledge, but he will not mention something that, can, that could only have come from a report from himself. So this personal opinion about the Qur'an, this is prohibited. Even a scholar cannot express what is called tafsir birrai, meaning even a scholar cannot give personal opinions about the Qur'an. The most that he can do is through deduction and through points related to language, mention what is there based upon uh, the science that he is discussing, not mention matters that can only uh, that could only have come from narration. And the final point that I would like to put, mention here is that types of tafsir of the Qur'an, the best tafsir of the Qur'an is tafsir, tafsir al-Qur'an, bil Qur'an, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains the context or explains or expounds upon a verse through another verse. So there is mention of something which is not quite clear, then later on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions some detail about it and that is the best kind of exegesis. Then obviously we have tafsir al-Quran bil hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself clarifies what a verse means. And then after that, we have tafsir al-Qur'an bi athar al-Sahaba, meaning the companions radiallahu ta'ala anhum, they explain the meanings of certain verses. And remember the Sahaba, they would never say something about a matter which could only have come from a report from themselves. And this is why all the Sahaba are just in terms of narration. So the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala anhum explaining a verse of the Qur'an really it comes from, or ultimately it comes from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam because they sat in his blessed company and directly learnt the knowledge of the Qur'an from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the last type which is often mentioned is Tafsir Al-Qur'an bil lughat al arabiyya That is when one uses the Arabic language to deduce apparent um, uh, patterns or meanings from the language of the Qur'an itself. So to conclude, the tafsir of the Qur'an is a profound subject. It includes, it involves many factors. A study of tafsir is important to appreciate what is required to even have a, a sound understanding of what we can take in terms of the commentary of the Qur'an. One does not study the books of medicine or science on his own and go into an operating theater and start operating on people. Certification is needed practice is needed. Someone of authority actually gives permission and a license is given to a person to even be in that situation. If this is the matter for sciences of this world, let us not forget this is the science of faith. This is directly our religion, our deen is based upon the Quran, which is our primary source. So one should not have an attitude where I, I can understand myself. I don't need anyone to explain the word of Allah to me. I can just look at a translation. This is not enough. So we pray to Allah subhanahu ta'ala that we understand the Quran through the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, through the explanations of his sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and ajma'een, and through the clarifications of the pious predecessors who were part of the unbroken chain going back to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Keep watching Madani channel صلوا على الحبيب صلى الله تعالى على محمد. The Quran is a clear criterion that guides us to the right opinion. The Quran is a clear criterion that guides us to the right opinion.